Hi, friends. Welcome to the Data Science Hangout. If you're joining for the first time, very nice to meet you. I'm Rachel. Uh, so the Data Science Hangout is an open space for the whole data science community to connect and chat about data science leadership, questions you're facing, and what's going on in the world of data science. Uh, the sessions are recorded and shared to YouTube as well as the RCDO Data Science Hangout site. So you always can go back and rewatch uh, older sessions or find helpful resources there too. We also have a LinkedIn group for the Hangout too. So if you ever wanna continue the discussion with somebody or ask other questions there, feel free to use that as well. I know a lot of times it's just me posting in there. So feel free to, to start your own post in that group too. Um, last week, Marcos had shared an idea of starting a show and tell or show and share thread there. So you could maybe highlight a side project you're working on, maybe a cool tutorial or article you found as well. But at the, the Hangouts, we're dedicated to creating a welcoming environment for everybody. So we love when everyone can participate and we can hear from everybody. So there's three ways you can ask questions today. If you haven't been here before, I'll, I'll walk you through this. So you can jump in and raise your hand on Zoom. You could put questions in the Zoom chat and feel free to just put a little star next to uh, your question if you wanted me to read it out loud, if maybe you're in a, a loud environment. Um, and then lastly, we also have a Slido link where you can ask questions anonymously. Uh, and my colleague Tyler just shared that in the chat right now. Just wanna reiterate, we love to hear from everybody. So no matter your level of experience or the area of work as well. But with that, I am so excited to be joined by my co-host for today, Tiger Tang, Manager of Data Science at Carfax. And Tiger, I'd love to have you introduce yourself and maybe tell us a little bit about your role, the company, and also something you like to do in your free time outside of work. Oh, sure. Thanks, Rachel. So uh, my name is Tiger and then uh... Uh, really glad to be uh, part of the data science hangout, and then uh, I've been uh, following uh, and then watching the, a couple of videos uh, in uh, in the past. They've been also very helpful to me. And then uh, so I'm currently a, a data science manager at Carfax. We are a, a company focusing on providing the uh, let's just say the data insights for uh, consumers to better own shop and then uh, uh, purchase their vehicle, all that. And then uh, oh great, I saw somebody uh, use uh, Carfax before, so great. And then uh, so. My role is uh, basically uh, building a data science team, and then that's uh, mostly focused on uh, NLP uh, because we receive a lot of car information where we have to use uh, a lot of the NLP techniques to handle and then uh, to make it uh, displayable on our product. And then uh, we also do uh, some of the forecasting, and then uh, that's my main team's focus. And then we do a, uh, a lot of analytics here and there. Uh, and then uh, for this team, we have uh, so far, we this is our second year. And then uh, so it's from uh, almost one or zero to now, uh, I think uh, around seven to eight people. Uh, that number fluctuates because of the number of interns that we have. Uh, yeah. And then uh, in my free time, and then uh, I like to uh, uh, collect shells, so seashells. Uh, if I go to uh, like a different beach, and then uh, I will uh, check out on the sand, and then uh, yeah. Just, uh, you'll probably, if you uh, see me, uh, you know, just uh, keeping my head down for a couple of hours, that's me just trying to find shark teeth, all that. Usually nothing can be found, but I just enjoy uh, looking for things. It reminds me of a little bit like uh, data mining, right? But usually I think uh, with R, uh, I, can, I can find a little bit more things, but uh, just me walking by the sand and then uh, by the ocean, uh, usually the sifter is not as good as the R tools I use at work. I love it. And that's why you have the blue background there, like the sea. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I know somebody had reached out to me earlier this week and said that they love to learn a little bit more about NLP use cases. And since you focus on this area, I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you use NLP. Oh, sure. Uh, so for that, uh, let's just say if you go to a, uh, a specific uh, Let's just say uh, one example is that if you go to uh, like a service shop and then to service your car, and then you will get an invoice of saying that this is the stuff that uh, that you have uh, they they have performed services on. 
And then basically we will probably receive like uh, information, pieces of information similar to that invoice layout, but then the data content is probably maybe could be uh, just written by the technician, uh, could be a standardized language for that specific location or management system. And then when we get there, uh, get that, and then it uh, could really be a million different ways uh, to say, to trying to express the same service. So this is where uh, we will try to uh, make a good sense of that data and trying to understand, hey, Rachel, for your car service, let's just say last Friday, what was being done there? So that uh, once we have that information, we can uh, display that uh, on the product. So then uh, I think most of our cases is trying to make the sense of the, uh, the human written data or that type of car related uh, information. And, uh, and I would say that techniques you would use is, uh, is something that could really uh, differ between, let's just say, if, you're, if we're just doing a prototype and the in initial proof of concept, you can just start by building very simple and straightforward, let's just say, uh, logistic models. And then uh, just to, uh, and there's, of course, uh, the Julia Silk, I don't know how to pronounce uh, if it was uh, last name correctly, but uh, <laughs> uh, there are books on the, uh, uh, what is that, the, the tidy, uh, models with, I, I think there's also a, with Emil and that book, uh, the supervised uh, machine learning with R and then on tax modeling, all that. Those are very uh, great resources if people are interested in, uh, let's just say, applying NLP uh, related stuff in their other work. Uh, but I guess most important case to me is to find a great, uh, is a, oh, somebody already shared the link. Thanks, Libby. Uh, and then uh, I think establish the business case first is very important, but then the model uh, development can really differ just based on the timeline that you have and the resources you have. Thanks for sharing that in the chat too, Libby. I was just about to say, would someone be able to share that because I'm bad at multitasking here and you were right on it. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, Tiger, I... I know you gave, I already just posted about this on LinkedIn because I loved your our studio conference talk as well. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience of kind of selling data science to the business and getting the team on board. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> that that is a great question. And then uh, I think it's something that, uh, I think this is also one of the uh, things that I, I really love about the uh, uh, what's been going on recent years about data science is that uh, I think let's just say uh, take the time back to 10 years ago and then people are still trying to have a better definition about data science but now uh, people from different back with different background they would have heard uh, data science here and there so I think it makes our job easier to sell the concept to you don't have to really bring people up to speed on the specific background to trying to say hey uh, if you haven't heard, this is a great, uh, you know, data science is a great help, right? But now uh, we, were, we, we get to just to be able to focus on saying that uh, if we can utilize specific data science tools or techniques, these are the specific business value that we can just bring. And then, so you don't have to sell the concept of data science. You just need to sell, uh, let's just say, specific project by project. So that's, uh, that's what I did in the past is that uh, once I realized, oh, uh, if there is a, a multiple different ways for us to develop, let's just say processes, processes, reporting tools to help business uh, people, uh, account representatives to better, better manage the account, to uh, to be more effective at the jobs, then I would just use that specific business case and then uh, share that with the upper management and then say, uh, hey guys, uh, I think I recently uh, you know identified this idea that will, as an example, will help us to uh, speed off our roadmap by two years. Uh, do you want to uh, hear about that? And but at that time, uh, I think the one of the things I learned is that uh, you don't at that stage you don't really need to mention any of the tools you use. Even though I I'm a big fan of R, big fan of uh, Shiny, and then I want to talk about it wherever I go. But then uh, I I think in the several of those experiences when I talk about when I get so focused on about the tools and about the techniques, uh, I guess that's, uh, that's turns out that's not everybody's focus. That's probably uh, people's focus when you share the same background, when you are talking to a fellow data scientist. So they're gonna get excited too. 
So, uh, but in this case, uh, I um, uh, just said, hey, this is the value. Uh, this is how much time you can save. This is how much business value that we can uh, accumulate uh, with such shorter time. And then uh, if you allow me, and I can present you a roadmap, right? If you give me like a one month of doing the pilot, I can even show you some of the initial business value. So uh, I never try to persuade people to say, hey, data science is valuable. I, I think showing it exactly, you know, give me a week, give me two weeks, I'm gonna show you a proof concept right there. And then uh, they will buy in the idea themselves. So uh, I think, so that's what have uh, worked out really well for me. And I think I also have a, a very understanding uh, leadership there. So uh, they're, when they, once they see that, and then I think the buying process went very smoothly. That's great, thank you. And, and I see Mark, you're commenting in the, the chat. Can I have you share that as well? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Sorry, can we go on video? Yeah, I just said that, um, Tiger, some of the stuff that you talked about in your conference talk have actually used um, like some of those ideas to get a project green light, basically just starting from the value prop and then working backwards to what I'm interested in, which is like how to do it. But, you know, telling to the stakeholder, like, here's why you would actually be interested in this, which um, I'm not always the best at, uh, at doing, going in that direction. So um, yeah, glad that, that that methodology worked out. Oh, great. Awesome to hear. Do you have any tips for how we can all get better at, at doing that or communicating that to the business? So I know it's like putting it in terms of the money and return on investment, but do you have other tips for communication? Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, one of the things I, uh, I think my, one of my former uh, boss and then uh, did this exercise a lot of times with me is that uh, sometimes I want to get uh, uh, let's just say the technical details. And then so he will, would always say to me, hey, Tiger, how about this? Uh, explain to me like uh, I'm a five-year-old. So that's where I'm trying to, that's where my, uh, uh, I just turn myself into like, a, let's just say, if this is a difficult concept, can I use very good uh, analogy there? Uh, and then to make people understand. So when I say that, uh, as an example, if I say I want to try, explore different uh, uh, NLP method, and then this will, uh, you know, need uh, different, you know, let's just say additional resources. But when I say that, hey, this is a di different deep, le deep learning method I wanted to try, how do I show that's a, you know, uh, because this is exploration phase, how do I show this additional value? Then uh, one of the, well, one of the analogy I came up with, I, I still, I'm still not sure if this is a good analogy. So I'm gonna try it and then you guys can let me know. So I'm gonna say that, hey, when you have the raw data, this is like a, you're, you have a, a you know, a, like a, let's just say rib by steak, right? And then uh, this whole modeling process is like a cooking. So uh, once you have the, let's just say logistic model, a deep learning, and then uh, let's just say the transfer models, then these are just different ways of cooking the same steak. And then let's just say you can pan fry, and then uh, you can uh, use an air fryer, which is the newer ways. And then, but we really need to try different ways and to identify the best way to cook this uh, piece of steak. And then the hyperparameter tuning, those are just, you know, us to trying to tune, change the time of cooking, turn the, uh, let's just say, uh, the, you know, use the oven for to change the temperature uh, of cooking, right? So uh, that's where uh, suddenly all of these big words from the, uh, uh, from those, uh, let's just say, machine learning methodology, turn it into something that most people can relate, right? And then, uh, uh, I think everybody, when I, whenever I said that and then people are like, yeah, yeah, I think I know what you're saying. So, uh, but I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I think analogy is definitely a great way to, uh, to get everybody uh, there. And, uh, and then another thing is that I would always hold, try to hold the urge uh, of sharing any of the technical breakthrough uh, that I really wanted to share with everybody. So one example is that, um, uh, I think uh, around four years ago, I was in the R Studio conference, and I heard uh, R Studio folks, and then talked talked about the uh, uh, the future future plus promises, so that you can have make your apps uh, async uh, asynchronous, so that you can handle multiple uh, uh, processes at the same time. I got super excited because I have several apps that uh, handles a lot of requests, 
that would have been uh, would have been uh, let's just say hundreds of uh, uh, ticket requests to our department. Uh, and then this is where I was saying, oh, we need to invest more time to do this. But then I don't really have a good way. And then I was saying we can make the app asynchronous. R is a you know it says uh, can only handle single threaded jobs. People are lost. And then I was like. How can you, you know, uh, how come this is, uh, you know, I, I think everybody had a great feedback when Joe Chan was talking about it. How come I can't, you know, get that across? And then uh, later on, I realized that it's uh, unless this is happening to people, uh, downgrading people's app experience, they should they should never need to know or is single threaded uh, because it doesn't really matter. So in that case, I was like, uh, I sense the room is uh, nobody's understanding what I'm saying. So then I was saying that, you know what, if we do this. Even if we have 10 users running those different tasks at the same time, their experience is going to be perfect. But right now, if you have them doing, the, doing that, I think everybody has to wait. And then the business side, yeah, let's do it. So I, I think this is the part that still, uh, of course, I, 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 I was still sharing that, uh, hey, we're, uh, once the promises are out, we're maybe, uh, uh, maybe one or two months after the talk I heard, I implemented right away. So uh, I was still proud of that. And I still talk to, let's just say, my team member to say, hey, you know what, later on, uh, you know, our studio folks told me, uh, once I shared this, our studio folks told us uh, we were one of the first uh, group that implemented this. So I still feel proud. It's just that I just don't share that with my stakeholder because I know, hey, fellow data scientists, they can get it. So I would say, uh, use analogy uh, wherever you can. Of course, run that uh, by your colleagues, maybe. Uh, and then, uh, uh, the other one is hold the urge of sharing technical breakthrough with your stakeholder or with your maybe upper management, whoever does not have, who doesn't have this data scientist back, uh, background as you do. And maybe share that with, uh, let's just say, uh, across uh, teams, something like that. That's incredibly helpful. Thank you. I see there's a lot of anonymous questions starting to come in as well on Slido. So just a reminder, people can ask questions over there on Slido too. Um, but one was, what's the difference between a business analyst and data scientist or data science manager in your eyes? Oh, uh, well, I, I can only offer my uh, <laughs> understanding there. So uh, business analyst, I think uh, in my uh, company, and then they would be more focused on, uh, let's just say, uh, building that bridge uh, between the business side and, and then some of the analytics side. Uh, and then building, let's just say, translating the business needs to the uh, development criteria that developers and then uh, let's just say data scientists needs to follow. So I almost think uh, business analysts, they have, they need to have the, let's just say, more have that, that business mindset rather than the analytical mindset. So it's, it's a mixture, maybe like 80, 20, something like that. But uh, if you're talking about, let's just say data analysts, they probably, we need to balance that a little bit more like a 50-50. And then for my role, uh, specifically for, for my company, uh, we're just, uh, I'm trying to develop this team. And then that have, let's just say, uh, data analysts, uh, data scientists, and then other function that related to how my company uh, utilizes data science. So I hope uh, uh, that helped uh, clarify that. Thank you. Niall, I see you asked a question in the Zoom chat. Do you want to jump in and ask it? Yeah, sure. So uh, you talked earlier, Sager, about um, bringing the ideas to the stakeholders, uh, which leads me to assume that a lot of your projects are created within the data science team. You know, you're spitballing, brainstorming, coming up with ideas, and then sort of selling them, which is is great um, when it works. And I'm curious about your your balance between those projects and projects that are coming from outside within the organization saying, hey, we really wanna do this and we think you guys have the skills to help and, and how you sort of balance those. And then also the success rate of, of each, I guess is where I'm really interested. Like, are they more likely to succeed if they're coming in with that outside buy-in at the start or uh, if they're coming in with your knowledge of data science? Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, that's a great question. I actually, uh, uh, well, this is something I'm still working on. <laughs> Yes, I'm uh, pre preparing a presentation to actually uh, uh, work. Uh, what is that? Evaluating some of those ideas for uh, business I business related data science idea. You know, coming from them instead of coming from uh, my team. Uh, so I would say that's that immediately just making me think about. Uh, let's just say two things. The first one is that uh, 
how uh, possible that is to achieve, uh, let's just say, in the realistic timeline. Uh, because when they, well, we, we definitely, uh, you know, a lot of the ideas coming from everywhere, but sometimes we may not really get the data to help uh, us to come up with a, let's just say, a, a reliable recommendation. So this is something that I think whenever we receive this type of request, I would always ask for, let's just say, one or two weeks of uh, uh, either, I, I wouldn't really call that a proof of concept, it's even uh, uh, initial investigation to trying to see how possible, you know, uh, that uh, do we have the, all the data points? Do we think this is, uh, this we can provide a viable solution to the business problem that they are talking about? And then uh, the next thing is, if there is a great potential, then uh, I will try to, uh, let's just say, uh, trying to see if we can uh, put this on our roadmap. So this would involve like a uh, prioritization. So uh, trying to say that, hey, uh, how big, how important this is compared to all the other projects that uh, the team is currently focusing on. So, uh, it, so to me, that's almost like two step. If there is, if everything uh, works well, right? Uh, we validate this uh, idea and we think we can offer some of the uh, viable solutions and then we teacher size it. Then we send it for, let's just say stakeholders to discuss to say, this one is gonna take uh, maybe half a year, but we are currently have a full roadmap. Do you think it's gonna, uh, we can do that maybe next year? If not, uh, how about the, uh, you know, you guys can uh, decide which one is uh, more important. But uh, yeah, I'm totally with you that there is a specific, uh, the success rate, I never thought about it that way, but uh, I never really measured it, I should say. Uh, but I would say it, it is something, I think what turned out to be the case is that some of the ideas that the business uh, folks that mentioned maybe two years back, and then now we suddenly realize, oh, we suddenly have the data, suddenly have the tools to make it happen. This is where we're going to pitch again among the stakeholders and then the upper management to say, now this is possible. But two years ago, uh, maybe not. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, I, I hope that, uh, uh, well, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's uh, my experience <laughs> on that so far. Thanks, Tiger. Yeah. What, it, what it was that, that process for going back to projects that were proposed like two years ago? Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, uh, we, we don't really have a specific process. It's, yeah. uh, it's almost like... Uh, uh, keeping track of all the ideas that we want to do in, in the that we didn't get a chance either the resources or we didn't know the technology to make it happen mm -hmm. or you even where it didn't have the data points to make that happen so uh and then from time to time uh, people will will come up with similar ideas uh it's just that if you, we revisit them uh, at a later time maybe uh once a year for all the past two years ideas i think sometimes we can uh, uh find some of the valuable information there, or even, uh, let's just say, uh, uh, updated or enhanced idea, like a sub idea out of those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm to track that. Oh, can you say that again, Frank? Yeah, do you use software to track that? Or, or do you, does everyone just keep it in a document and like you get together for the annual idea hash? Oh yeah, I wish we have a, so, well, we are trying to find out better software but usually it's just a, a, like a document where we have that, but uh, uh, we use like uh, the roadmap tools. So the roadmap tools will uh, save all the ideas where we put on blocks. And then, so once in a while, we will look at all the ideas uh, on uh, maybe block from two years ago. And then uh, uh, I think so far we've been uh, able to catch that through that. Uh, but I guess hey, if we are able to set a reminder to say, hey, let's revisit this in two years, uh, I think that would be great too. <laughs> Definitely. I see there was an anonymous question a bit earlier that was, um, Tiger, I looked at your background and you have an education in business school. Is that a path you'd recommend to people interested in data or more tech fields? Uh, oh, so for the education, oh yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, well, that, that wasn't a really planned, <laughs> to be honest. The uh, uh, At that time, I think the, People are still trying to define, I think the graduate school trying to define uh, the data science related majors. So it just happened to be under the business school. 
Uh, but of course, uh, we have some of the business school courses, uh, which turned out to be very helpful. Uh, but, I, but I think uh, I also heard a lot of great talks uh, in the past on the, the data science hangout. I, I think, uh, I, I don't think there is a, like a specific requirement for the people in the, let's just say, have to have the, uh, those type of background. But I guess, you know, all of these, uh, uh, I heard a lot of people uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the podcast. And I, I watched uh, uh, Frank's uh, episode that then he also mentioned a, a bunch of the uh, great recommendations there. So I think with those, uh, we don't really have to, let's just say, go to a specific business school to get that information. I, I think it's, now it's all available online for free. So uh, I almost think that uh, it's, a, it's a mindset that we need to all acquire. I think it's a, it's an important direction we need to go, but it doesn't really need to uh, go to that specific school, I would say. Also love to hear that you're going back and watching the other episodes too. <laughs> yeah, the, oh, those great. are great. <laughs> Frank, I see you had asked a question in the chat. Do you want to jump in for that? I would love to. Uh, Tiger, I'm really curious. Are, are you or your team exploring using in any way, shape, or form some of the newer large language models like GPT-3 that are coming out, right? Like you do NLP work. There's some awesome advances, which pairs really well with the idea of revisiting projects that weren't possible before. Yeah. And if not, are, right, do those hit your radar? And are you hopeful that you will be able to use that in the future? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we are. And then, uh, but uh, this is something that I checked with my, uh, I, I was planning to have like, a, uh, because so this is the Thursday uh, uh, event, right? And there's another Tuesday event that people uh, want to share like uh, what's going on with the work, all that. So I was prepared, all prepared to talk about oh, this is how we do NLP uh, at this company. And then uh, later on, it's, uh, I was told that, oh, these are uh, let's say something that I'm not allowed to share. So by mm -hmm. high level, I am. Uh, the details I cannot share, but yeah, I'm super excited about those. Uh, and then uh, uh, exploring uh, those things. And then uh, I, I think one of the, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one of the, the rest I'm gonna say is, uh, I, I think I, I will receive some questions there. But uh, I, I, yeah, I'm very high level. Uh, I'm very excited. And then uh, this is something that uh, we're, my team is uh, exploring. Yeah. Right. You got to be uh, probably as excited as I am that it's September 1st and OpenAI is bringing down the cost of hitting their, their <laughs> API. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Cool. Thank you. Uh, there was an anonymous question now that was, what is your relationship with IT like at your organization? Oh, um, yeah, I, I think so overall, uh, I maintain a very good relationship with IT department. And then, well, I, I, I think this is one of the uh, amazing thing about uh, working at Carfax, in my experience, is that uh, uh, they're just usually very uh, extremely helpful. And then uh, I know that uh, while you're doing a lot of exploration, Sometimes you run things on your computer, you'll get a lot of questions, right? And then sometimes installing things. Uh, but I think, the, well, maybe because I maintain a very good relationship, uh, the, I, when I, whenever I got a call out and then uh, it's uh, not that serious, but I, I would say uh, one of the, maybe uh, if you're at a much bigger you know, organization uh, where you do not get to know the whole team, then uh, uh, I think it would be nice to, uh, at least, you know, explore the, let's just say, uh, maybe run, run it by them for some of those uh, things that you're going to do. And then sometimes we even need to have stronger hardware. And then I think uh, uh, these are the part that I think maybe because uh, we're like a mid-sized company. So uh, knowing them uh, personally uh, actually uh, smooths my experience. So, uh, uh, but I guess uh, if people have uh, uh, let's just say other experience with a bigger company or let's just say different experience there. I yeah, love to hear about those as well. But if, if we are in an organization, a huge company where we don't know IT yet and we haven't built relationships with them, what do you think is the best way to go about that? Oh, then uh, I would say, uh, let's uh, build a relationship. <laughs> just connect <laughs> with them and then... Uh, and then say that, hey, here is something that I will need to do. And I will need uh, a lot of those things that will need admin rights. Uh, I think uh, probably people, uh, uh, some of the people can relate. And then, uh, uh, yeah, and then I just tell them this is uh, exactly what you're going to do. And then uh, sometimes 
I think people is they are going to tell you, hey, nobody can have at a minimum rice, and then say, uh, can we have like one day, right, or two hours, where you can even uh, just look at my screen, or you can help me there, up to you. So uh, when you are asking for uh, smaller things, people are less likely to say no. So, uh, but I think my original ask was that, oh, uh, I need at minimum rice to make this work, but then no, and then I was like, uh, can we have one one day, uh, and then uh, I think the the response is uh, much uh, softer. So uh, that's great. Does your one day turn into multiple days? Yes. <laughs> uh, I hope my uh, IT friends didn't see this. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody else had a question earlier it was how much time do you explain R or any other specific language within your organization? I'm not sure if that's getting at like training or explaining the languages to business users. Um, but it was anonymous. So feel free to add more context too in the, the Slido. But on that note, do you do training for, for people who are just interested in, in getting started learning? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, and then uh, I think before I uh, got my... Uh... Uh, let's just say went to the uh, came to the U.S. for the uh, uh, let's just say data analytics or data science degree. Uh, I have been a teacher uh, in China, and then uh, so I really love the the feeling of, let's just say of, of sharing and helping people uh, to succeed in a way. Uh, and then uh, so I, I really enjoy teaching. And then uh, so this is where I think after I we gone through the initial art training at our organization. And I began to develop the uh, uh, materials uh, for folks and then uh, who might uh, not able to uh, capture all the learnings in, uh, let's just say, compressed two to three days. And then we have some the follow-up training. And then later on, uh, when there's new things, and then we will just do a sharing session. So uh, as of right now, we are also, my team is also preparing for uh, some of the uh, recurring sharing session uh, around the company. Uh, yeah, and then also, uh, well, after the R student conference, participating in that, and then uh, of course we're gonna do a, like a show and tell. This is what you learn. So uh, I think it, it is something uh, would always, uh, well, if it if we can build a, like a regular cadence, just like a data science hangout. Similarly, within the company, I think it's a great uh, a growing atmosphere that we can build, and everybody. Uh, not everybody can, uh, well, we, we only have the energy to focus on a small part of the, which is the R packages that we're interested in. But then uh, if we can uh, gather that together, and then uh, it's almost like we're learning, let's just say from four other people, four other people, five other people are all helping us to gather the information. So uh, our learning speed is uh, uh, should be uh, uh, much faster. <laughs> That's great. And do, do some people join those those groups or those sessions who are just like starting to like scratch the surface of data science or just starting to express interest? Oh uh, yeah, so uh, that is always a hard part because people have different uh, need, right? So the training will be uh, open to uh, business people uh, who are interested in analytics uh, and then new R users and then uh, data scientists, uh, senior data analysts, all that. Uh, so when it comes to that and then uh, I will, at the beginning of the training, when I send out the invite, I will, cons I will say, these are the expectations. So before this training, you're expected to complete X, Y, Z. And then after the training, uh, you will expect it to master X, Y, Z. So if you already know the answer to, let's say this next two questions, no need to come to the training or the sharing session. So we will have, let's just say the uh, beginner to intermediate session one time, intermediate session one time and then advanced session maybe a few only a few people will show up so but having that uh having set up the expectation and of course always record it uh and then uh, uh people then it will be helpful for people later on so uh uh this year we all my team we have uh, several new people joining then uh, uh we have them to let's just say look at the past recordings and then uh, uh, the past handbook that we created uh, uh, within Carfax uh, about R. Cool, thank you. I see, Lisa, you just asked a great question in the chat. Do you wanna jump in? 
Sure. Um, I'm just um, curious, and I'm sorry, I did jump in a little bit late, but I did go to your talk at our studio conference, which was awesome. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, what types of tools, like analytics tools, were available to you on your first day? And then if you could, like, you know, I in your talk, and, and so far today, you've talked maybe slightly more generically about how to get you know, buy-in from whoever the people are you need buy-in from, but like, was there a specific project? And I know you probably can't talk about details, but maybe like the themes of the type of project it was, was it more like machine learning type stuff? Was it more like, I don't know, shiny, reproducible reporting, like what sort of area kind of helped you most convince people of the tools you needed? Uh, yeah, this, that uh, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. It does. Thank you, Lisa. And then this is a great question. So I would say, uh, I would just uh, first answer your the later part of the question is that work what really worked out uh, for our project for my project is uh, uh, it starts with a shiny app because the shiny app uh, it has actually has a, a shorter runway of developing. So uh, and then after and then once while well, you have the shiny app developed and uh, I think our well, this is something, well, I can still make it very gener shareable. So is that, let's just say we receive a lot of business uh, requests and then to handle that business request is something that you will need to have an analyst to uh, look into uh, databases, to do a lot of uh, uh, web requests, and then to compile those maybe in, uh, let's just say in R, in Excel, all that, and then share like the, like the finding for a specific, uh, let's just say query. And then, but, uh, as more and more requests that we are getting from, from them, we realize that uh, it is taking a lot of the analyst time. And then, but then the logic that we follow to get those uh, information is very similar. So then we decided to build a Shiny app and then to have all of these things handled by Shiny. So then instead of uh, having the business folks creating a, uh, let's just say a request, uh, go to our internal system, gets assigned to our business analyst uh, or, or data analyst there. And then uh, they would have to wait in the queue, right? For maybe one or a day or so, maybe a couple of hours. Then they spend, let's just say 30 minutes to work on it. Now it's gonna be a click and run for the requester. And then this whole workflow will be gone, right? Will be replaced by Shiny. So uh, the initial app that uh, I think Sirius app that I developed and then uh, just does exactly that. This is something that uh, allow the allow me to say, with those three shiny apps or the first series of shiny apps, we were able to handle. I think yesterday I did the count again. Uh, I think it was each week, uh, well, well, each month. Now we are still handling 560 requests that would have been a, a ticket request coming to this department. And then so with that, uh, well. The modeling stuff is something that you will need a longer runway to prove the value. But for the developing of those apps, uh, is much shorter. And then uh, the request uh, that the business need that you handled is uh, is something that would work maybe for majority of the corporates. Is that we are just saving time. We're making business requests handled faster than before. And here is the value. Uh, and then the back to your first question is that uh, so. Uh, luckily, I joined this company, uh, Carfax, as an intern, and then I moved to uh, a business analyst, uh, and then data scientist, and then uh, 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 trying to develop a team. So I started, at that time, I, uh, I think what was available to me was Excel and SAS. <laughs> so uh, maybe uh, uh, some of the folks, uh, maybe you uh, using the same <laughs> at that time, right? <laughs> now we're all trying to move to uh, different things. Oh, so what were those steps then from going from Excel and SAS to being able to use other tools? Oh, it's uh, oh, <laughs> this is the process that uh, I think for me, I was just so excited about those uh, new stuff. So uh, I kind of forced myself to uh, learn things very quickly, uh, but we, we have a whole group, right? At that time, I'm just one of the team member. And then when I saw, oh, there's a lot of potential for people to do the same, but I couldn't really... Uh, it, it, it's difficult for you to talk to your, let's just say, colleagues uh, side by side and then to say, hey, there's a much better way to do it. Uh, it's, uh, 
I don't know, it's not, it's not really a good way to trying to uh, stimulate change, right? Uh, especially when you're on the same team. So I think little, what I found uh, was that, oh, what if uh, I can just uh, try to automate, streamline this process, and then I just show them, oh, uh, you know what, uh, Rachel, uh, this one, you see, you you handed off me this process uh, two months ago, and then used to take, I think, you know, half a day, uh, let's say each week. Now uh, with this, uh, it's just, uh, I just need to click and run. And then, uh, so, and then you would, uh, it's easy for you to see the difference. It was like, oh, I know that you have a similar task there. Uh, I can, uh, you know, if you, if you would like, we can work together to get that uh, started. So gradually, that's how I was able to identify, oh, if we could make that, the streamlining things into a project, uh, this is how I got the work automation project. And then, uh, so instead of trying to do the, all the training to get people to adapt all the new things, uh, you make that whole, Im whole mission as a, uh, as a project. And then so people were like, yeah, this is a business thing, a business initiative we're doing. We're not asked to learn new things. We're just work, asked to work on this business initiative. Throughout the process, people are, let's just say, voluntarily, they fall into the trap, a learning trap that I set up for them, right? And then they got the excitement of getting things working by click of a button. And then they gradually, they want to know what's going on behind that. And then uh, whenever there is uh, error messages, they will come to me and I would say, oh yeah. So whenever this one shows up, it means that one of the environment wasn't set up correctly. So we're, we're not asking them to learn it from zero to one. And then we're just saying, uh, I'm gonna hand you off at uh, two, you know, halfway there, right? And then gradually you're, you are going to try to go back and then uh, go forward and then trying to uh, see the direct value there. So uh, it sounds like uh, very similar to how we get to the stakeholder is that we'll just, I'm just gonna show it to you. I, I don't want to, I don't need to be correct uh, to persuade you. I just want to be helpful. And then uh, this is uh, one of the, I think having a, making a business initiative uh, makes people forget about, I'm uh, asked to learn new things, all that, right? So uh, we kind of get past that. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, in a way, I think this is, a uh, is almost like a hacking, <laughs> hacky way of uh, getting that done. Thank you. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you so much. I know this is something that a lot of people face in their organization. So sorry if I just like drive into this <laughs> too much, but I'm just really curious though, if, if people can't like use the tools to begin with, do they just like, do it on the side or like they're just like using shiny on their own desktop or did you use shiny apps io like what do you do first like a first step if someone is like completely like roadblocked by a company uh oh are you talking about let's just say uh, well you were saying like you shared that like a better way of doing this and now this report that used to take half a day is now so much quicker ah uh, right but i'm, I'm thinking about the people who have told me like, I really want to do this, but I can't do it yet. Do we just like go ahead and, and do a POC and then show someone later? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think if I understand the question correctly, I think uh, we have to probably do a, for the initial, first initial things, uh, it may be hard for, for you to ask for time or resources to say, this is something new I'm going to try. I heard every, you know, people outside the company heard it's uh, great. Uh, so this is where I think I spent uh, uh, initial time at the very beginning, just as an investment. Uh, I guess sometimes you, uh, because at that time I was, uh, I feel the urge to, uh, to make it happen. So I spent some extra time to make that initial thing work. But then later on, it makes it easier and easier for you to ask for resources and time. Uh, and as for a uh, uh, shiny app, and then the, the initial one uh, is, well, we don't really, well, th there's also the open source uh, uh, Shiny server, right? So you can always use that as a start and then to, to pitch your idea and then uh, hosting it on your desktop, it also works. So let's just say uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, it, uh, he developed, uh, let's just say the auto evaluation for the files that we need to look at. So if you have 
uh, like a specific raw data that you need to analyze. You know, the steps that you do for the initial uh, analyzing is, is very similar. Then you set up the uh, an analyzing function right after the import, just using a Shiny app. So with a click of a button, you will see the, uh, let's just say, the analyzed, uh, let's just say, the, uh, the summary stats that you're looking for specifically for your company, for your team. So you can just use that and run it on your desktop and then showcase that. And then immediately, I would bet people would at least use 10 to 15 minutes to set it up, all that. But if you make that automatic, just uh, with a click of a button, it's, uh, it shows the value right away. And you don't well, need to go through the, let's just say, server, setting up server, all that. Thank you. Super helpful. I see um, a few questions from earlier. One was, what are the typical project timelines given that Carfax is a consumer facing service? I'm sure this varies, but do you have an average? Uh, unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Another question from earlier was, how did you actually quantify the number of hours that you save the organization with automation and data science? Yeah, that's a great one. So uh, you have to, uh, so uh, that's something that uh, I would say uh, at the very beginning, uh, you want to have a clear definition of what type of time you're counting. So when you're running, uh, let's just say, when you're working on analysis, so pulling data, let's just say from different databases, that will take time, right? So if you're doing a step-by-step, -step, uh, it's also taking up your time to wait for those queries. Those are what I would just say is the processing time. Regardless if it's uh, two days or one hour, I don't count those. I only count the actual time that people have to be focused uh, to interact with things. And then that's just my definition. Uh, I'm not saying uh, this is a, my, uh, well, this is what, just what I do, not my recommendation specifically. But once you identify that, oh, it's going to be the manual hours that people spend, then before you apply the streamlining or automation, before uh, you can ask the current uh, report owner, process owner, maybe sometimes it's yourself, estimate the number of hours you need to spend, right? On a weekly, daily, monthly basis first. And then you, uh, you, time, uh, you, you, you time yourself again after you streamline it. So you will... So what I used to have is, is a table of things. These are the tasks that we applied automation for. This is the before uh, time. And then each month, if it's a daily task, you use that daily task times 20, right? Whatever number of days that you need to uh, work on that. And then this is the afterwards time. And then so it's, uh, it's a very simple uh, uh, table that you can calculate. So each month, and then you can say, hey, I apply automation on the five ta tasks as listed. This is the total time saving. But before we need maybe 50 hours. Now we need two hours in total. We save uh, 48. That's great. Thank you. Super helpful. Um, Libby, I love the question you just put into the chat. Would you want to jump in here? Or I can um, set. Oh, there you are. Oh, yeah. we have Kitty. <laughs> Thank you. Very needy Kitty. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, I was going to ask about onboarding. So onboarding in data science teams can be a little bit of a challenge for some people. And I've been through that as well as a data science employee. Um, and I was wondering if you'd found any kind of best practices that make onboarding a more positive experience for everybody, including like team members that are existing, right? Like that can be a burden for a new person coming in taking other people's time to like train them and then get them up and going on stuff. Did you have anything to share? Oh yeah, I, I think that's a great question. It's still something that I'm uh, trying to improve. Uh, so I wouldn't say uh, it's uh, maybe it's not a good recommendation, <laughs> but uh, just, so what I do now, what we do now is uh, uh, we try to, it, I, I feel uh, the onboarding, the way I think about that is almost like uh, you're training, it, you're offering a specific training uh, for people to, let's just say, to get better and then uh, to uh, get, to get them prepared for the, the work. Uh, and then the working culture, the, let's just say, the uh, institutional knowledge, all of that, and setting up the, uh, them for success for those tools. And then uh, uh, in general, we would have, uh, let's just say, like a, like a guideline, almost like a training guide. You have the agenda. 
or hey, this is what what we want you to go through for the first, let's just say, one month. And then, uh, and then a lot of times we will use the let's just say videos, and then uh, we will have the in personal training online with different folks that touches different uh, ideas, touches different subjects. Uh, but I guess for specifically for data scientists or data analytics roles, what I have found helpful, or I think one of the keys I, I want to get them up to speed is um, analytical project. And those type of things are usually deeply connected with the business needs. So this is something that usually I would just start with the high level business goals and then making sure the business goal clicks first. So, uh, so you know, let's just say if this is for a, uh, let's just say specific project we're working on, then I want to first go over how uh, this report, how this process will help us to, or help another team to get, let's just say, more accurate result, more, let's just say, more effective uh, approach to deal with, let's just say, uh, to be make a better product. And then I will go over the, let's say, high level process of what individual staff will, we will need to go through. So uh, to usually the tasks that we were gonna first hand off are the ones that everybody can click and run. So we are trying to minimize their learning gap and then not trying to intimidate people uh, intimidate people of, oh, there are so many things I need to learn. No, we're going to give you that uh, a quick success feeling first. It's almost like, you know, getting people trained up with R, right? I want you to feel the power of click and run. This is great. I helped solve the business problem that Tiger just mentioned to me an hour ago. And then lastly, I would go over the difficult part that we face in this, uh, in this process. So those are the ones maybe tricky part. For example, if we're, uh, uh, if this is a shiny app we're supporting them, I would go over some of the last common things that uh, we would use or more difficult, which is more complicated uh, setup that we have. Uh, for example, if this uh, analyst is not, uh, is not familiar with the, let's just say, uh, future promises, then it's a good idea uh, for, for us to be prepared to share that maybe as a last step of handing off that project to them. Uh, so typically onboarding, that's what I would follow, is uh, minimize the, let's just say, don't get them, uh, don't intimidate them, uh, just start with the why we are doing things. And then we offer, let's just say, the quick success feeling, feeling everybody is, you know, uh, uh, feel, feels great about this process. Lastly, we went over the harder ones. So later on, let's just say the next iteration, uh, people will feel, oh, uh, I know exactly why I'm doing this. I know how to do it. So that's the second step. And lastly, in case there's any difficult questions, uh, I can reach out to Tiger or I can uh, you know, figure it out based on the information Tiger shared or other team members shared. So I would say that's my uh, uh, high level uh, idea for onboarding. Thank you, Tiger. That actually sounds a lot like getting executive buy-in or business partner buy-in, but like offer quick <laughs> wins, build trust, and then move into things that are more difficult or more complex. I think that's fantastic. I've never heard it described that way. Oh, I thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, I guess uh, in, uh, I kind of feel like in, in the end, we're uh, we're just working with uh, people, right? <laughs> right, so, yeah, either oh, way, it's cool. people. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to make uh, all the experience smoother. Uh, and I guess, we, oh, it all comes down to us to bear all of these, uh, uh, let's say, ideas, you know, in our own mind. <laughs> so people working around us, uh, they're, let's just say, receiving the uh, uh, good experience there. <laughs> Love that advice. I see Brittany, you have your hand raised too. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, when I heard onboarding, my mind literally started like flying off in fireworks. Um, at least at my company, we over years have tried to refine our onboarding process constantly. And one thing that we found is actually using, um, like making sure that your onboarding is really, really well documented. And then knowing who is responsible for what in terms of onboarding. So whenever we onboard a new team member, they typically have a mentor that will be their mentor for at least the first six months, probably the first year that they're with the company. And then they have their team leader and their specific tasks that we've actually assigned out to the mentors and the team leaders. Um, and one of the things you brought up too is making sure that that new team member has a focus and has ownership, something that they can really like run with and provide value with. And we've actually used a Microsoft Planner to like literally lay out almost like an Asana type board 
where there's tasks assigned to each person and like all of the nitty gritty things from like HR onboarding all the way through like reflection after the first 90 days, it's all kind of laid out there. So I think it's also good just to really like, even if it's as simple as just post-it notes on a whiteboard, really understanding all of the different things that someone has to do when they onboard and then making that plain and available for them. So actually you make sure there's no gaps or things that you miss when you're onboarding people and maybe on person A got, you know, X, Y, Z when they onboarded, but they missed ABC and things like that. So we just found that like having something like that set up and then just making copies for each new person we onboard was really, really helpful. I'm curious for both of you and, and whoever wants to jump in, uh, Colin from our studio and I were chatting about this with onboarding. How do you also ensure that you share the team culture right from the start or the company culture when people are going through like so many like checklists of these are the things that I have to go through? Yeah, so from from uh, I think just now I, I, I heard great advice and then uh, I really like the, uh, what to say, I think everybody's uh, prefer the visual type of uh, uh, layout. And I think that's, yeah, uh, that's something I'm definitely going to check out. Uh, and then let's just say from, from my side and then uh, we, uh, well, we bundled that task. Let's just say we, we work together uh, with HR team on that to make work fun. And then, so that's how one of the things that we promote. And then we also have like, it, it, so we would kind of share that task and then uh, so HR team will uh, organize the, uh, let's just say, since most people are online now, uh, the online events and then uh, to trying to have that, uh, let's just say, uh, a different experience outside of the Zoom meeting uh, type of uh, work. And then, uh, and I guess the other one is that we also sometimes, it's, uh, the com I think the company culture type of thing is something uh, I also try to uh, try it a lot of different ways and then try to say, oh, this is how I experienced. I want you to feel maybe similarly. But then I realized that I have uh, several years of uh, staying in this company. So it's something that I think later on, uh, I realized it's, it's something that maybe we will just uh, from time to time let the people experience that, uh, just give them more time. So we will share the this high level, but in the end, I will always say or share that it's something that you will have the first-hand experience yourself. So uh, I would find an opportunity for them to connect with other team members uh, in person if there is an opportunity. Uh, but if not, and then uh, we will just uh, try to, uh, I think, you know, connect with people online with different uh, Zoom activities. I think there is a, a different vendors for that type of activity as well. Um, I, Alan, I'm sorry. I realized I missed your question earlier. Um, do you want to jump in and ask that one? Yeah, um, and no worries there. This is the classic, like, I have to ask a question and then go to my next, um, like, far less interesting um, meeting at the, at the top of the hour. Um, but I'm curious, Tiger, if your team ends up in a situation where you build these really, uh, like, interesting, develop, and exciting tools that provide lots of value for folks, and then end up needing to sort of support and own it for the long term. And if you're faced with the dilemma of how do we you know, provide that support while continuing to give like meaningful, interesting new work to the folks on the team. Um, for for me, that's a dilemma of figuring out, you know, how do we maintain stuff and also continue to develop? Um, and so I wonder if you've got a good a good solution there. Yeah, uh, Alan, that's a great question. So <laughs> I, uh, well, luckily I think, uh, we, yeah, we still need to do that as well. So it's the same issue that we're facing here. Uh, so, so luckily, I, I guess the maintenance work uh, is probably uh, of the, let's just say, maybe five to 10% portion. So it's a very small portion. We don't, we haven't uh, uh, got to the stage where we have to impact our, let's just say, regular bigger project. But one of the things I think uh, we are trying to follow uh, in the past is that if it's just to just maintenance work, that will have this, for example, application to keep functioning. We will definitely take care of it uh, right away, you know, as soon as we can. Uh, but if it is new additional features, we will uh, treat that as additional, uh, just brand new work. We wouldn't mm -hmm. consider that as something that oh, we, we feel obliged to uh, to work on that, you know, before uh, any of the other bigger projects. Uh, we try to follow through the uh, the prioritization process that uh, mentioned earlier. Is that uh, for that type of work? 
uh, we will treat it as a brand new thing. And then we will try to evaluate to say, you, uh, with this uh, enhancement feature versus another brand new app, which one does the state quarter want earlier? So, uh, so I think we will, if this one indeed has more business value, uh, then we'll work on that first. So in the end, uh, we will let the business side to decide which one has more value. So, but using that, uh, having that, it did save us, uh, let's just say, save us from some of those dilemmas where we feel really obliged to uh, enhance that feature but then we don't really want to delay another next exciting uh, project. Mm -hmm. So uh, once we have followed this prioritization method, I think everybody feels better uh, yeah. of how, <laughs> because we are following a specific process here. We're not trying, it is not me or the team member saying that this is something I don't want to work on. Uh, so I hope, I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, for sure it does. I really appreciate that, that distinction. And I think establishing that expectation that we, We'll need to do that kind of prioritization and life cycle thinking with stakeholders is really important. So I think it's a good mark of success that you're able to do that and say like, you know, there's a maintenance category and there's a new work category and we need, you know, stakeholders help to help navigate and steer those things. Um, so yeah, really, really appreciate it. Thanks. Um, great, great conversation. Um, thanks. thanks everybody. Thank you. And I, I feel like the hour went by even quicker today than it normally does. So I know we're a few minutes over um, and a few people have to go run to meetings and Tiger, I think you might have to go run to a meeting as well. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for sharing your experience with us. Um, if people do wanna stay on and chat, I'll keep the, the bridge open. I think there maybe were a few questions they didn't get to, um, but Tiger, really appreciate your time. If people have follow-up, is the best place to connect with you LinkedIn or, or Twitter, which you prefer? Oh yeah, uh, LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, okay. Say, yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. And uh, we can share that in the, the chat here as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day, everybody.